Thank you very much. Again, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, obviously, you know, intravitreal injections have become something that we do on a very, very regular basis. And I want to just go through some cases and kind of um, talk a little bit about the, the um, infections and end up the Midas after intravitreal injection. So I'll start out with the first case. This was a 78-year-old uh, um, Hispanic male, and this all happened on a Sunday. He came in, right eye had been painful for about two days, a history of AMD, and he'd been injected with a Vastin two days prior by an outside ophthalmologist. His visual acuity is 42. I mean, his visual acuity is light perception. His IOP was 42. And you see this um, hypopian and um, uh, you know, um, retrocorneal um, opacification. The thought was it was an endophthalmitis. It was thought to be infectious, but other possibilities did include um, uh, you know, non-infectious causes. Tap and injected, and he was sent out. About an hour later, the next patient came in, um, visual acuity of light perception, and he was injected with IVA two days prior by the same ophthalmologist. Another patient, the third patient of the day, hand motion, IVA two days prior by the same MD. And yet another patient who was injected by IVA two days prior by the same MD, which is clearly a problem. And what I'm talking about here was an outbreak of post-injection endophthalmitis after intravitreal uh, Avastin. And there was 12 cases total, one to six days after injection. Nine came to the Bascom Palmer ER, and three were seen in consultation. And none of the cases were originated at Bascom Palmer, but they had occurred in offices of four community retina MDs in Miami-Dade and Broward County. And 10 of the cases were culture positive for strep, uh, strep mitis oralis, the oral flora. And seven unused syringes were also positive for strep mitis. And the Avastin was all prepared by the same compound and pharmacy in Miami. And state and local health departments, as well as the CDC and FDA, investigated the source of contamination. Now, seven of the 12 cases resulted in loss of globe via nucleation or evisceration, and we got to see these in the pathology laboratory. So both clinically and pathologically, we got to see the material. And I'll show you a couple of the cases. This was had underlying diagnosis of diabetic macular edema, came in with visual acuity of hand motion, tap and injected, underwent a pars plane of vitrectomy. And before nucleation, you can see that the retina was completely gone posteriorly, and this was under oil. Patient three came in a light perception, had a vitrectomy, and again, under oil, the retina was markedly, markedly necrotic. Um, and this was after having been diagnosed within a couple of days. Patient seven, a visual acuity was 2040. You see the hypopian and the vitritis, I mean the, uh, the fibrin and the vitritis, and uh, this is the only patient that did well. The patient went up at 2025. Presumably, there was a smaller inoculum of drug at, um, of uh, antibiotic of, um, um, bacteria at the time of injection. And when you look at the cases, you see that all of them except um, one had um, poor visual acuity in 2025. Um, number, they all went underwent injections, and most, a lot of them had pars plane of vitrectomy. I'll show you one other case. This was case eight where the patient um, came with light perception. You see this ring infiltrate. You see the hypopian. And um, the patient um, had um, eventually wound up undergoing nucleation. And uh, the ultrasound prior to nucleation showed a marked amount of membrane and changes. On pathology, we see that there was a cyclic membrane anteriorly, which you see here. And there was um, uh, an abscess present anteriorly, which you see here. But interestingly, none of the um, specimens showed gram-positive cocci um, for the other were gram-positive, presumably secondary to the fact that um, they'd had vitrectomies and intravitreal injection. And here there was a marked amount of proliferation in addition to the cyclic membrane, and there's a retrocorneal membrane, which correlates to what we see here. The retina was necrotic posteriorly and gathered, and even more necrotic, full thickness necrosis anteriorly. And the other eyes that were removed, one showed a retinal detachment, which is gathered centrally. Here you see a cyclitic membrane. Here you see necrosis, subretinal um, hemorrhage, as well as a prolifer proliferative vitreoretinopathy. And finally, the last one has mostly necrotic retina. You just had some retina gathered anteriorly. So we saw a greater severity of findings in the anterior aspect of the globe, abscess formation, full thickness, marked, neck, marked retinal necrosis, detachment, rubiosis, and cyclitic membrane. And there was also posterior involvement. And presumably, the anterior involvement, uh, more and more worse findings, was secondary to the deposition of the, um, uh, the, the bacteria anteriorly. Um, 
this got a lot of media coverage. Um, in New York Times, they said to save money using a drug not approved for eye uh, treatments. And the question is, is what, was, what, what happened here? Well, the centus is typically comes from the manufacturer to the distributor to the physician, and they inject one patient. A Vastin manufacturer, distributor, compounding pharmacy, typically, unless you, um, uh, unless you do this yourself, multiple physicians, multiple patients. And in this case, there was manufacturer, distributor, pharmacy, compounding pharmacy, back to the pharmacy, physician, and uh, multiple patients. And the question is, is, does the additional risks in the supply chain make a Vastin inherently riskier? Well, the process is safe. This is Serafin Gonzalez, who was the first, um, our, our pharmacist who started the uh, compounding of Vivacin when we started this back in the early uh, 2000s. We've had over 150,000 syringes prepared without contamination. And the way we handle this is we track things very carefully. The drug comes in, we mark it down, note the lot, and then we pull it up. And um, when we do the, um, uh, when you see, when we do the, um, we spike it once, um, and then we pull up syringes, and we put them all into, um, into, uh, into quarantine for 14 days. 10% are cultured, and if they're culture negative after 14 days, then it's okay to use up to 90 days. And because of this, we've never had a problem. And the cause for the South Florida cases was there was poor adherence to regulation, multiple spiking of the vial. They didn't do it once, they kept doing it, and they were clearly not using um, uh, sterile technique, and there was oral flora that got into the, um, into the, um, into the uh, medicine, and um, this led to the problems. So the best practice for clinicians, if you are using drugs, you should um, document the lot for each injection, have patient contact information. If you can use bilateral injections, perhaps use uh, different lot numbers, and, um, excuse me, and assess the compound in pharmacy, at least in the states, we make sure they comply with USP 797. So we published this data, and then one of the questions is, okay, so you show all this fibrovascular proliferation. A lot of people say, okay, it's a nice path paper, but, but so what? Well, Alan Ruby in the group at uh, Beaumont um, had a case of an 88-year-old woman who had bilateral ranibizumab for AMD and um, came in two days later with uh, infectious endophthalmitis. She got IV and ceftaz, and um, strep species was a culture. Three months later, she had a retinal attachment with some proliferation. And the question was what to do. They read our paper and they decided, well, if we don't do something, that we're going to get one up with all this fibrovascular proliferation, we're going to lose the eye. So they did, a, they did a vitrectomy and they retained the eye, which would have been unlikely if they had not performed a vitrectomy. So I think some of the studies learned in the laboratory can be helpful clinically. So we've shown um, endophthalmitis secondary positive drug. Here's another case. This was a 72-year-old female who um, had endophthalmitis after IV injection ranibizumab. The eye was removed. And you see similar findings, what we saw before, where there was neovascularization of the iris, neovascularization of the angle, a cyclic membrane, uh, retinal attachment, and PVR. And th these findings were very similar to what we saw prior. And so um, one of the questions is, is, what's the endophthalmitis incidence? Well, the in incidence is really quite small. It's about 0.049% by Colin McCannell report. Sterile inflammation does occur, and the peer per patient rates associated with accumulative risk. Obviously, this is per injection, and the more injections you get, the higher the, the incidence, um, the risk factor is. So what's the risk factor? Well, it appears that aerosol contamination in the surgical field by respiratory flora is what really causes the problems. And this can be, um, for the healthcare workers, um, the provider, maybe the source of the um, procedure-related infection. And basically, one of the questions is, is, it seems that either using a mask or not talking will decrease the chance of getting flora there. So um, there was, when the panel was put together, you know, what were the guidelines to treat these patients or to, to handle them, was insufficient evidence to support use of pre-, peri-, or post-injection antibiotics. So we're not using antibiotics. The IV injections may be safely performed in an office setting, which we do. Um, bilateral procedures, you can use them, but we use separate sites, separate sites preparation. Do one, stop, do the other one. And uh, sterile and non-sterile gloves can be used. Iodine is very, very important. It should be the last thing instilled in the eye. And a speculum should be used. And um, no significant difference was found if um, there was conscious displacement, the hemisphere of injection, and the type of anti-VEGF um, agent used. A commonly asked question is, is, what happens if the patient is allergic to iodine? Well, we've never really seen patients truly allergic to iodine. We usually do a skin test, and we don't do injections unless they um, get iodine, because that seems to be the most important thing. 
superior infer location. There is no real uh, studies don't show that one or, or the other is superior. I tend to go inferiorly because the patient often bells up, and you don't want to be caught bellsing up, and you get to get caught against the lid. And postoperative medications we're not using because studies have not shown this to be helpful. So standard preparation. Uh, you use the margin should be prepared with uh, povidone iodine. Use a lid speculum. Avoid lid margin. Wear a mask. Avoid coughing or sneezing. And this is we usually I don't have the the, the patient's mask, but we do have the the, uh, the nurse as well as myself mask. So here's a, one other case. This was a 62 uh, year old male who presented with diabetes, and he had diffuse macular leakage. This was his um, fluorescein angiogram, and he didn't have response to laser therapy, and he was got intravitreal injection of trimcinolone. He came in four weeks later, and his vision was hand motion. He had hypopian. He got an, underwent a tap and inject, and acid fast bacilli was found. He was referred to Bascom Palmer, and he was diagnosed with, um, he had, after multiple, um, uh, he had a lens, pars plantar vitrectomy, tap and inject. Uh, mycobacteria was cultured, uh, mycobacteria chelonia obsessus. And um, he underwent five separate tap and injections. And he was enucleated three months later for a blind, painful eye. And the eye, again, looked somewhat similar. What we saw was a lot of fibrovascular proliferation. And the eye was full of uh, histiocytes as well as uh, acid fast bacilli. So this case was published. And it basically, um, mycobacteria was a rare cause of intraocular infection, a rare cause of endophthalmitis. And cases of cutaneous and osseous infections have caused mycobacteria chelonii, have identified long-term corticosteroid use is a risk factor. And what may have happened here is that the endogenous endophthalmitis, the patient may have had a disseminated um, uh, infection with a distant focus, and uh, the endogenous endophthalmitis may have developed in the setting of local immunosuppression secondary to the intravitreal injection. So this is another possible cause for this. Now, there's a couple of masquerades that we may see. Here's a patient who comes in with a hypopian a day after an intravitreal trimcinolone, but there's no fibrin, there's no redness, and there's no pain. And this is not infectious endophthalmitis after um, IVTA or after trimcinolone. So when we looked at some of these cases, we found that a number of them had had anterior segment uh, vitrectomies, pseudophagia, or uh, open posterior capsule. Two of them came in within an hour because the stuff just came forward. And uh, there's no pain, no edema, and basically there's an increased conjugate injection, and it resolved within two weeks without any treatment. And it's important to know when not to treat because tap and eject is not an innocuous procedure. Here's another patient, basically a white eye with hypopian. And you see here clearing of these over, over um, a couple of weeks. So that's pseudoendophthalmitis from IVTA. And I want to final, final, uh, finish up with um, a patient of mine that had, it was a 73-year-old Hispanic male, and he had AMD in both eyes. And he was referred to me, and um, we decided to give him a flibercept. He'd been getting um, uh, Avastin. And um, this was his OCT. And he got treated, and um, typical injection, and there's nothing special about the injection, standard technique, but he came in on day eight with some decreased vision, some pain, uh, mild pain, and um, it was thought that this was sterile uh, inflammation from uh, ILEA. The differential diagnosis included this, but it was thought to be uh, sterile. He was put on a uh, Forte, and by 14, day 14, his visual acuity was 2400, there was cell here. This is the OCT, but you can see the eye was white, no fibrin, no hypopian, no redness, but the vitreous was really markedly dark. This is 14 days later. Um, and he was, he was, there was no evidence of any fibrin in the posterior uh, segment. And we watched him carefully. He sweated a little bit, but we watched him. And um, by day 38, you see that finally he was clear. And one thing in, in here is differentiating infectious versus non-infectious inflammation. Um, hypopian and fibrin is very important. Um, you see hypopian and fibrin in most cases of uh, true endophthalmitis. Pain is important. Pain is a very uh, significant sign of, uh, of uh, endophthalmitis. Vision loss is important for endophthalmitis cases. And the way to differentiate pain is moderate, severe, as opposed to mild and infectious versus non-infectious. Vision loss is severe um, um, versus mild to moderate non-infectious. Fibrin always present in rare versus non-infectious. Hypopian is very common. Vitreous opacity is usually prominent and mild in uh, non-infectious cases. And the conjunctival injection is very common, usually absent. And the retinal findings include intravitreal hemorrhage, whitening of vessels.
just about done. And then, um, so infectious, as we see this in the left with hypopian, fibrin, um, and a redness and pain, and the right, non-infectious cases typically don't have that. And non-infectious inflammation usually resolves that antibiotic therapy. Um, culture usually culture negative. And this is a very rare finding, but we have seen selected outbreaks of this. And in all these cases, they decrease vision and vitritis, 